following is a Comfortably Zoned Radio Network production. We are back. DeGraw's Yankees. I'm Ralph Tycho with the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network, and I've got the man with me, the DeGraw man. Jack, how are you, sir? Good. How are you today, Ralph? Oh, good. Can't wait to talk a little Yankee ball with you. Um, it's winter time, so mainly we do hot stove around these parts. Really not much happening. Anything uh, to update us on along uh, current Yankee ways? Well, the only thing down here in Tampa, Ralph, they're having the Yankee Fantasy Camp this week, and some of the players are reporting in, and probably – you know, by the end of this week or early next week, uh, you know, they'll, they'll be starting to take a BP outside over at the Heinz, the minor league complex. So it's just around the corner. It's sneaking up. Uh, I don't know if they have the old rule that you can't report early unless you have some sort of medical uh, problem that you're rehabbing uh, through. But I've noticed in the last few years Maybe it's because of the rash of injuries. There are a lot of guys reporting earlier and earlier. These guys stay in shape all year round, and it's basically become um, you don't get to spring training to get in shape. You get to spring training to work on your baseball skills. Am I right? Yeah, well, well, the, the thing is, Ralph, they have the official opening at spring training, but these guys can still work out at the minor league complex. And the thing is now, it used to be like a week for the pitchers, which it still is a week for the pitchers, and a week for the, you know, the, the regular players. But now it's like four days because these guys are down here right now, uh, you know, working out. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a whole different thing. It's, uh, you know, 12 months a year job. It's getting there. Let me ask you, are there any outstanding question marks besides Machado? Now, you, well, the thing is, Ralph, you wonder, you know, if, if Torolinski is going to stay healthy and how the, you know, the, the new guy Mato is going to uh, step in. And, uh, you know, I, I would like to see him get another pitcher. I mean, uh, the bullpen is outstanding, but, uh, you know, you never know till the game starts. So, uh, okay. but but they got a solid At team. This late date, do you think there's still a chance they'll sign Machado? You know, it, everything's so up in the air. I, I think there is a slight chance, but I think he'll have to come down in the you know the contract demands and. Uh, you know, it's like at this point, like whatever he's going to do, I would just wish he would do it instead of, you know, like uh, playing all these games. Okay. Do you? Uh, my only other question be, for you before we get into the hot stove league here um, is the theory that there's some sort of uh, conspiracy amongst the owners to keep the prices down. Do you consider that to be um, the price is all coming down, definitely. Is that a correction or is that um, a correction in the market or is that, you know, something that uh, the Players Association, the union, whatever you want to call it, are they going to strike over? Are they going to hold out over this? Um, it seems to be a problem. Bryce Harper, um free agent out there they could be saving all their money for next year when you're talking about trout coming out but um what is your and opinions are just that what's yours about this well i i think the thing is the the owners have gotten together you know to, to knock down all these uh contracts and the interesting thing is most of the fans will side over with the owners you know, because they'll blame the players for, you know, all these big contracts. But, I mean, baseball makes billions and billions of dollars. The Yankees could sign Machado. They could sign Harper. They could sign all these guys, and it would be just a drop in the bucket. And they seem to be putting less and less of that those billions of dollars into contracts. So that's what the players are complaining about. And as for the fans complaining about what the players make, 
It's ridiculous. They don't complain that Barbara Streisand makes a million dollars or this, that, and the other thing. Um, it, it, you're paid what they will pay you. Um, you deserve whatever it is they think you deserve. They'll pay you. They're not holding a, um, a gun to the, the owner's heads when they sign these con- contracts. Uh, everybody is making money. And um, that therein lies the problem. I um, I know that ever since Marvin Miller died, things have changed. There was a guy that um, knew how to stand up to the owners, and it's very difficult. It sounds crazy, but when millionaires come against billionaires, it's the billionaires that that win. And also, remember, you're not throwing any benefits for the players, but it's a lot of competition to get there. They are world-class athletes, and they're sharing in the profits, um, as would you. um, If you you worked at a job, you're sharing in the profits of your boss's enterprise, and that's the way it goes. So... um, I, I mean, on another level, Ralph, look what these minor leaguers get paid. They don't get paid anything. And, I mean, they're in the 1% the of their field. They're the, top of, they're the top of their field, practically. They're right there. $400 right. a month, $1,000 a little. month. And these guys invest their youth five years out of their lives – they invest in making a thousand dollars a month for six months a year, whatever it is they make, and to hope that they'll make it big in the majors, where um, financial success is virtually guaranteed. But to get there, you know, you take a team where um, a, a team that like in the Northwest League, the California League, the Florida State League, a low A minor league team. And the chances of making it on that team, like three guys on a 25-man roster make the majors. The rest are fodder that go through the minors in giving up a big chunk of their youth playing the come. So the ones that make it, you can't take anything away from them because they made it against all odds. And um, so the players shouldn't be blamed. Uh, Truthfully, the management shouldn't be blamed as long as it levels out between the union, the player association, and management, and they get their fair way. The only thing as a fan that I object to is that oftentimes, over the last 20 years, labor disputes have resulted in screwing up the game to the point yeah. where the World Series was canceled. Oh, uh, yeah. One year, and the man who cancels the World Series is now now in the Hall of Fame. So <laughs> we, can't, we can't make logic out of any of this, just as we can't make logic out of what's going on in our uh, in our government, in, in our places of worship, in um, in our jobs, uh, it's all screwed up. It's, it's a crazy world we live in. But it, it, I, it sure I just is. want to say, don't blame the worker in any profession. It's um, the worker is suffering in our society. Big business um, and baseball's big business has its foot on um, on labor one way or the other you know you're yeah if you're in, if you're playing out your option or whatever it is you're playing by by the big boss's rule and um, that's why we miss Marvin Miller so much in this world yeah well I, I mean the thing is Ralph a lot of these minor league guys they go over and play in the Dominican Republic Venezuela and stuff, they get paid five times the amount of money over there than they do in the minor leagues. In the Dominican Republic, 
the kids get like $82 every week or every two weeks. It's, it's ridiculous. Whoa. And this is Dominican Summer League. They get like $82. I don't know if it's every week or every two weeks. So, I mean, you know, come on. A lot of these kids get exploited. My friend who pitched for the Expos like 20 years ago, he said he come over 17 years old, they gave him $2,000, and they brought all over like 20 players at $2,000 a piece. Incredible. That's changed a little bit. I think the um, the minor league draft now includes foreign countries. Am I correct? Uh, yeah, they they put a cap on it because a lot of times, you know, the agents, the kids were getting fifty thousand. The agents agents were taking, you know, seventy five, eighty percent of the of, of the pay. So that's gotten a lot better. Okay, so corrections are being made along the way. Somewhat. Hey, let's get a little upbeat because we have a uh, we plan to talk about something that's always upbeat and fascinating for me, and that is the number of players who uh, started either started with the Red Sox and went to the Yankees, or started with the Yankees and went to the Red Sox and gained prominence. Um, let's reverse it. We all know about the Babe Ruths, the Wade Boggs, the Johnny Damons, who came from the Red Sox to the Yankees. But just off the top of your head, do you know of any Yankees who gained prominence by going to the Red Sox? Well, I remember this well when Elston Howard in 1967 went from the Yankees to the Red Sox, and, you know, Ellie couldn't hit like he used to, but they raved about what he did with the pitching staff. Dick, William, Dick Williams told his pitcher, do not wave off, you know, don't shake off Elston Howard, and that's when they had the miracle team in the 67. Yes, that uh, terrific Red Sox team. Yaz made his bones that year. He had the Inigliero boys, at least one of them. Um, I think Tony was up. Oh, uh, his brother brother wasn't yet ready, but it was the Jake Woods at second base year, if I remember correctly. Um, another guy with great potential for the Red Sox hit like 190, but they won the pennant with him at second. Um, that was. Uh, that was a good year. And El, you're right about that. Ellie absolutely anchored that pitching staff. He, he, like you say, he didn't have much in the bat left. and uh, But it was weird to see him in a Red Sox uniform after all that time as a Yankee. Well, Ralph, I still have the Daily News picture. And Ellie's in front of his locker, and he really didn't want to go. I, th I think his wife, once again, a Yankee wife, you know, gives the good advice. And, you know, Elston went to Boston, and, uh, you know, they, they achieved a lot. Right. And she wrote a book, if I'm not mistaken, about how much Ellie not being named Yankee manager broke his heart. Um, I don't know if it contributed to his death, uh, literally. He died a very young man by uh, today's standards. But I believe he was 51. Yeah, wow. Wow. My memory of Ellie as a coach with the Yankees is the guy who came between Billy Martin and Reggie Jackson when uh, they went at, went at it in the dugout. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah, it was a Saturday afternoon game. And, you know, Ellie had a way of making his presence felt without really, you know, sort of like not being the center of attention. But, you know, when Elston stepped in, everybody stepped aside. <laughs> right. He was a big enough guy, physically um, big enough, that he broke it up. He had one hand on Martin, one hand on Jackson, and uh, – he just kept them apart, which 
it's probably a good thing for Reggie because historically uh, Billy was the boxer, Reggie was the lover. Um, <laughs> just uh, he'd have killed him. <laughs> and Billy had, was inflamed that day because he thought that Reggie showed up the Yankees. Showed up. Um, he just took, I don't remember if he just loafed for the ball or uh, what were the circumstances. Well, it was a it was a Saturday game on NBC, and they were playing up in Boston, and the Yankees, I believe, were getting beat pretty good. It was something like nine to three. And somebody on the Red Sox hit a single to right field, and Reggie just, like, jogged after it. And after the play was over, uh, Paul Blair come running out to right field. And, you know, then Reggie come jogging off, and they had the, the altercation in the dugout. But they had a lot of stuff going on that year. But uh, they turned around when they had to, and, you know, they, they won the pennant in the World Series. And Reggie became Mr. October. Yeah, four homers on four pitches in the World Series. What a what an incredible feat! What a streak! Um, just as they're playing the Dodgers, and I'm an old New York Giant fan, and when the Yankees play the Dodgers, it's like just I'm not even a um, a fan. I'm just an observer because I have no horse in the race. I have no dog in the race. I, I can't can't tell you how neutral I feel when those two teams play um, and that got me right there that got the blood rolling in me I can't describe it but um, just as a fan that was the as dynamic uh, um, a game as two games actually as as could be um, Wow uh, quite a World Series. What, what are we going back, 35 years for that one? Well, that was 87. Oh, my God, Ralph, that's 40 years. 40 years. Wow. Oh, my. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and if uh, you're out there and you happen to be blessed by youth, that's fleeting, and it's more fleeting than you can imagine. If someone would have told either of us 40 years ago that it would have been it was like snapping a finger and it's 40 years later we would not have believed it how quickly time flies and um, so live it as if it's the last and um, in keeping with that let's go back to some memories of uh, other Red Sox who became Yankees Anybody who comes to mind for you, Jack DeGraw. Well, well, Ralph, you want me to go back to, like, the Babe Ruth era, just, era, just throw a couple things in? Yeah, please, if you would. Well, this is kind of interesting. In 1918, the Red Sox won the World Series. They won in 1915, 1916, and 1918. And the manager for the Red Sox was Ed Barrow. And the four pitchers for the Red Sox in the series was Sam Jones, uh, Joe Bush, Carl Mays, Babe Ruth. The shortstop was Everett Scott, and the catcher was Wally Shong. And all those guys played on the 1923 Yankees. Oh, wow. And all those pitchers, they won over 200 games in a Yankee uniform, and if we want to go on a little bit more, Red Ruffing was 39-96 and 96 with the Red Sox, and this is like in the 1930s and 1940s. And when he come to the Yankees, he won 231 games. And, uh, you know, it, it wasn't until Brady Ford broke his record, but the four pitchers, Jones, Bush, Mays, and Ruffing, Ex-Red Sox pitchers won over 450 games for the Yankees. Wow. Crazy Talk stuff. about holding over another team in the trade market. <laughs> That's incredible. What do you attribute that to, mostly? 
Did the Yankees well, have I mean, enough money to, to buy up the world? Well, that's it, Ralph. I mean, this happened, you know, 100 years ago when the Yankees bought everything from the, the Red Sox. And then you look at the great teams the Philadelphia A's had, 29, 30, 31, and they had to sell off all their players, you know, just to stay in business. And that's why Connie Mack used to sell everybody to the, you know, the Yankees. And that that continued when the Yankees were in, uh, you know, in the 50s, when the A's were in Philadelphia because they didn't have enough money. And look what's going on now with the Marlins. So, a hundred years look later, can, you see look how Kansas City supplied the Yankees in the fifties when they were yeah that's it not just as a farm club when they got a major league team from Philadelphia um, yeah uh, but you know it's not what you, sometimes it's what you do with the money not just having the money so there was some uh, smart eggs behind uh, just throwing the money around. You mentioned Weiss to me. Um, that's a great story you told me off the air, by the way, about fate. You want to repeat that? It's pretty cool. Well, in 1916 and 1917, the Yankees had a manager, Wild Bill Donovan. And in 1922, Ty Cobb, mentioned to George Weiss, who was the GM of the New Haven team, the minor league team, to hire to hire Wild Bill Donovan. So Donovan and Weiss were going to a baseball meeting in Chicago, and they were leaving from New Haven. And Donovan had the top bunk, and Weiss had the bottom bunk. So Weiss was 20 years younger than uh, – Donovan, he says, well, let's switch bunks. So Donovan took the bottom bunk, and Weiss took the upper bunk. And on the way to Chicago, they had a a train crash, and Donovan was killed instantly. And Weiss, because he was in the top bunk, you know, he hurt his back, and he had some leg lacerations. But it's just fate stepped in. I mean, if that was Weiss on the bottom bunk, who knows what the Yankee dynasty would have been. Yeah, and we talked a little bit about how in those days he was a scout. He uh, basically was doing for the Yankee organization in terms of building a farm system uh, just what Branch Rickey was doing for the Browns and then the Cardinals. Um, it was He was uh, that important. And believe it or not, if you talk about George Weiss, George Weiss was instrumental in in building the Miracle Mets of 69. He took over with Casey to run the team, and they didn't do very well. But in the years that he was in charge, they set the tone for the future. He brought in guys like Tug McGraw and Cleon Jones and the like. I uh, think he may have even been in on the Seaver draft, and it did become a draft because Seaver uh, was first drafted by the Braves, and I don't know for what the reason was, but he was thrown back in into a um, a draft. Do you remember that specifically? Uh, vaguely. I, I, I'm not sure of the whole story. I know Seaver was at USC, and he did get drafted by the Braves, but I, I think he, he opted to stay at USC another year, And but I'm not really positive of the story, but, boy, what a pitching staff the Mets had with Kuzman and Gentry and Nolan Ryan. It's incredible. Oh, absolutely. Um, and, again, um, it all, always comes back to why Gil Hodges isn't in the Hall of Fame. Cause, well, there's no question he should be in. Yeah. On another show, we'll talk about uh, who should be in and who's in and that should be out. <laughs> but um, let's talk about some of the Bra- some of the Red Sox who have joined the Yankees in the last century, in the last part of the century, 
Uh, we talked about the early, early days, but how about the Johnny Damons? How about well, uh, you had Clemens, Sparky, Sparky Lyle, right? Roger it. Clemens, right? Uh, well, I remember Boggs. they got what's that, uh, Ralph? Wade Boggs. Yeah. Well, they won the series with him at third. <laughs> yes. Yes. So, um, long-standing tradition that uh, Red Sox do well in pinstripes. Well, I'll tell you, Ralph. As, as a lifelong Yankee fan, I have I've never really disliked the Red Sox. I've always had a lot of respect for them. I mean, they have a tremendous, you know, tradition and. Uh, you know, the, I, I think the Red Sox are a, a class organization. Yeah, well, but I mean, what? Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead, Ralph. That's all right. Oh, I was just going to say, in '58, uh, right after my New York Giants left for San Francisco, stuck without a team, I scoured major league rosters and teams to see who I was going to root for. And I did happen to note with the Red Sox that they had the uh, the incredible outfield of Jimmy Pearsall in center, Jackie Jensen in right, and Ted Williams in left. They had, um, oh, what was his first name? The catcher was a catcher by the name of White, and he was... Oh, Sammy White. Sammy White was a long-term National or American League catcher, and he was, he was solid. Um, they were only weak at shortstop. They had Ted Lepsio, if I remember correctly, and um, but a good infield. Dick Gurnett, um They were a good ball club back though, and they they got a fair addition for my heart. Um, Ended up, I ended up being a San Francisco giant apologist <laughs> all those years. So, um, but that outfield was as good an outfield as I got to witness in my youth. Pearsall was tremendous in center. And Jackie Jensen, who was afraid to fly for one reason or another. Um, yes. Yeah. Was an MVP one year, I think it was 1960. Um, and what can you say about the thumper, Ralph? You want me to tell you a Jimmy Pearsall story? Uh, please. I was at a game in July of July 24th, 1966, and it was a doubleheader against the Angels. And we were sitting out in right field, my mom and me and my uncle. And we were like in the first row, and Jimmy Pearsall was playing right field. So when Mantle got up, he used to goof with the fans and come back and stay on the, the, you know, the warning track. So the fans would be throwing peanuts at him. And he was the first major leaguer I ever heard talk. <laughs> and he turned around and said to the fans, he said, the next person who throws a peanut at me, I'm going to come up there and kick you in the ass. <laughs> So, so that's my Jimmy Pearsall story. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll relate one. Jimmy Pearsall later in life, and this is firsthand from uh, Peter Golenbach, who was there to witness it in Arizona. The Cubs had a fantasy camp where they would invite players, uh, players to uh, coach and manage the different teams and they divide teams of fans who came down for a good time and they get instruction on how to play the positions and how to bat and they divide them up up into teams but and it got pretty competitive but it was basically for a good time and it happened to be co-ed and Jimmy Pearsall was coaching one one of the teams, and his shortstop, a woman, has a ground ball hit, 
and it goes right between her legs. And Pearsall comes storming out of the dugout. She didn't get down low enough. She didn't <laughs> bend her knees, whatever it was. He comes storming out of the dugout, lacing profanities at her. You blankety blank, blankety blank. And I'm on podcast radio, so you can imagine how bad yeah. he was saying. I'm not repeating, <laughs> repeating the words. Um, and the woman and everybody in the stadium, in the surrounding area, just stunned. They had coaches march him off into the dressing room. You change. You get out of your street clothes, out of your uniform, into your street clothes. We have a plane re- ready for you to wherever you came from to <laughs> take this gig. <laughs> And you're out of here. <laughs> That's the way it was. <laughs> but this was well after he retired. Well, you know, he was, you know, brought back as a, as a celebrity, and uh, he just went nuts. He really um, was a, a little touched. It wasn't just um, an act for for the movie with Anthony Perkins. Um so that's my Jimmy Pearsall story. Not to top yours. Yours, yours tops mine. Believe, believe no, it or not. Ralph, I, I'll tell you I, why I yours tops. That. Go ahead. Go ahead, Ralph. Sorry. No, you talk. No, I mean, I, I just remember reading about Jimmy Pearsall when you, you probably witnessed it when he hit his 100th home run and uh, – you know, ran backwards across home plate. I, I think I don't Casey think got. I wasn't at that game, but it was in '63, and that was his last hurrah with the Mets. He had earlier in the that year, they gave him uniform number 34. His uniform was 37 in his career. Well, Casey Stengel wore number 37. But he bitched about it. Casey Stengel said to him when they they cut him after running around the bases backwards, there's only room on this team for one clown. That's me. (laughs) 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 It was gone. But um, a damn good time. I, I do remember him sitting under the monuments pouting about something in Yankee Stadium. There's a picture on Google somewhere of him doing that, and I rem- uh, vaguely remember the instance. I remember a fan ra- uh, ran down on the field, um, and he literally kicked the fan in the ass with a place. Oh, I've seen that picture. <laughs> yeah, right. With, with a kick that w- would have pun- uh, gotten the ball 40 yards in the NFL. Um <laughs> As the guy's running away, he literally kicked the guy in the ass. <laughs> um, when you said uh, he'd come up in the stands, he meant it <laughs> he, that that day. And that was the first time you heard a major league ball, ball player talk. How old were you then? Let, let me see. I was, I was nine years old. And the thing I remember about that game, I remember the Yankees won a doubleheader and Mickey hit a home run. Tom Trash hit a grand slam, and uh, Joe Pepitone hit a homer. And the thing, I, I also I remember, Ralph, in the second game Steve Hamilton pitched. Steve Hamilton coached college baseball, and he was Phil Simms' baseball coach at Western Kentucky. There's some more useless trivia. Well, absolutely, and it's not useless at all because uh, – Got me to nod my head. Well, wow. I went, wow. But then again, um, there are a few of us out there. Um, hopefully, whoever's listening will get one of these things that we're going, saying. You can't get this stuff anywhere else. You realize it first. <laughs> Jack, you're uh, an amazing person when it comes to Yankee well- work. Well, Ralph, can, can I just say one thing? I, I'd like to say something about Mel Stolomar. Oh, please do. Rest in peace, Mel. Mm. Well, uh, I, I think, you know, well, Mel was one of the best pitchers the Yankees ever had. 
And I remember when I, my mom wanted, you know, was going to take me to Yankee games. I used to get out the schedule, and I would figure out like one, two, three, and then Mel was pitching. One, two, three, Mel was pitching, and I must have seen Mel pitch eighteen, twenty times at Yankee Stadium. And I remember seeing him hit a home run, and I had the pleasure of meeting Mel uh, a couple times. And, and you know, when one of your childhood uh, heroes dies, it's just a sad thing. And uh, you know, rest in peace, Mel. And, Thanks for the great memories. Yeah, well, I can't concur anymore. Um, he was a pitching coach of the Mets when they won in um, 86, as a matter of fact, and for about 10 years. He was a gentleman, and if you've been around baseball, as um, Jack and I have, you talk and hear a lot about a lot of players no one has ever said a bad word about Mel, Mel Stoudemire, pure and simple. No, he, to me, he was like the classic pitcher. It's just a shame, you know, he didn't come up in the late 50s, and he got hurt when he was 32 because there's a guy I looked at and I said, this is a Hall of Famer. You know, the Mets had Tom Seaver, who was tremendous, and, you know, the Yankees had uh, had Mel Stoudemire. So, uh you know, it, well, it, it, it was a, it was a sad day when I we had Larry, We had Larry Goel, a former Yankee pitcher, and we were talking off the air. Um, you had seen him pitch one of the few games that he did pitch for the Yankees. And we had him on a show on the George K. Show on this network the other day, and he just so happened to mention when he came up, the guy that greeted him in spring training and was – you know, asked about his family, how can we do this, how, how can we help you, and this was just a rookie at the time, um, was Mel Stoudemire. He mentioned that was, he was the, uh, the Stan Musial of his team, uh, of the Yankees. Wherever the Yankees went, no matter what it was, they looked, you know, in the airport or whatever, they looked for him to, uh, t- you know, just lead him. He was a natural-born leader and a quiet one. Ma- many of them are in the Gil Hodges sense that uh, you didn't hear much from him, but um, but he led by example. And um, Man had class. Yeah, it was a big loss uh, for, New- for New York baseball. And, Ralph, why don't you say something about Eli Ger- uh, Gerber? Uh, Eli Gerber passes uh, in the same week as uh, as Mel. Eli Gerber was the first player taken in the expansion draft by um, – he, he had the first win of a California Angel, Los Angeles Angels at the time. I don't – I think he was the first player taken. I know he was drafted off the Yankee roster – to get there, and I had the privilege of meeting Eli when he was a pitching coach at Reno, and I was the tops rep, and um, he was, um, I'm chatting with him, he says, come out to the mound with me, I have to throw BP to these guys, (laughs) and I stood behind him. While and we chatted while he's throwing BP, and he's talking about all the old days when he comes up with the Yankees. Um, he came up with a guy that you may remember because he won a watch in spring training for the for his rookie play. His name was John Gabler. Oh, he was another pitcher. Another pitcher came up for a cup of coffee, but he was up with Eli, and they'd hang together. And both of them, either Gabler was Jewish, I don't think he was, I think they were both not Jewish, but because of their fame as as a Yankee, they go into Jewish delis, and they put them on a sign, the John Gabler sandwich, the Eli Gerber sandwich. They thought these guys were Jewish in the Jewish deli. He got a big kick out of that. He knew I was 
from New York, and he got a big kick out of his New York days fooling the New York delis into thinking he was Jewish so he could eat free, and they put his <laughs> hand up for him, for him with his, his Yankee name. But that's my me- memory of uh, Eli Gerber. Uh, if you go to Google and you put in comfortably zo- or go to to YouTube, put in Comfortably Zoned and Eli Gerber, someone on the network, and I uh, interviewed him a year or so. I, it was either um, um, Wayne Unger or uh, Peter Trunk or, or someone, but I never did get I think interview. it was Wayne. Was it Wayne? Good memory. Yeah, because I listened Good to memory. it the other night. <laughs> wow. You do listen to our shows on, not only on them, but listen to them. So, um, oh, yeah. Yeah, because the stuff is very interesting and stuff. It's amazing what you can learn, Ralph, after you think you know it all. <laughs> was that a yogiism? No, that was one of mine. <laughs> oh, all right. <laughs> all right. Well, had Yogi lived, he'd be quoting you as we speak. How about that? <laughs> Hey, thanks for a terrific show, Jack. Uh, Yankee fans all over. We got uh, spring training. What, what is it, 21 days? Yeah, 21 days. I was talking to my friend Bob today. He's coming down from New Jersey, and we're planning to get tickets. And next week, Ralph, the Yankees have a co- – the uh, college team is playing at Steinbrenner Field. So everybody out there who's stuck in the snow, it's uh, not too far off. Okay, well, when you mentioned 21, the first person I thought of, 21, Warren Spahn. So for next week's show, we're going to talk about the 57 and 58 World Series between the Yankees and the Braves. How about that? Okay, I mean, uh, that, that, those were two great series. I mean, Ralph, from 1955, here's some more stats, through 1964, the Yankees, let me see, 55... The Yankees were like in eight World Series, and six of them went to seven games. And here's another stat for you. In 1954, they won more games than they ever won in those years, and they were beaten out by Cleveland, who lost to my New York Giants in the World Series. (laughs) Well, Well, Ralph, from 1949 through the second game of the 1957 World Series, no team outside of New York won a World Series game. Right, and you could take it to 59. Um, it was an ex-New York team with with the Dodgers. So um, that um, that's amazing. I've said this before on these airwaves. You grow up as a kid in those years, you think it's a birthright with the World Series is played in your hometown. Well, it was a great era to be a baseball fan, and it's always a great era to be a baseball fan, uh, but that was something special. Hey, and it was a great era to be the firstborn grandchild in the Nis family. Uh, yeah. That's another story. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, my friend. It's always a pleasure, and thank you all for listening. It's the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network. DeGraw's Yankees. Adios, everybody. Thank you, Ralph. Proceeding was a comfortably zoned radio network production. 
Thank you for listening.